welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we have a wonderful lecture by Neville Goddard, a little different than what we have covered in the past. This one is titled Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, delivered on February 15th, 1963. One of the best things about Neville Goddard is his interpretation of the Bible. In particular, the characters of the Bible are not actual real people from history. The Bible is speaking to your imagination, and the characters of the Bible are states that we all move through. And in this lecture, he explains the states of Moses, Elijah, and Jesus as they're discussed in the Bible and his own personal experience moving through these states. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus by Neville Goddard. Today's subject is Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. In biblical language, a man's name reveals his character. The name is an expression of the essential nature of its bearer. As I've said in the past, these characters are not persons. They are eternal states through which the immortal soul passes to awaken as God. These are the eternal spiritual states. To understand tonight's subject, let us go back just for a moment. As you know, as I told you, the Bible is God's plan, something to be understood only through revelation. It's revealed. It's true. What seems the most impossible thing in the world will prove itself true in time. The book of Genesis is the seed plot of the Bible. As we remember, it began with God. In the beginning, God. And the book ended on the note, in a coffin in Egypt. The one in the coffin was called Joseph. Joseph is human imagination. It is of one tissue with divine imagination. But here, it is human imagination placed into a body. He exacted from his brothers a promise that they will not leave his body in Egypt. They will take it up to the land that was promised by God to his forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was a pledge by the brothers, exacted by the brother Joseph, that ends the book. The seed plot of the Bible. Then we start toward the unfoldment of the seed planted in the book of Genesis. The next book is Exodus, and that's where Moses comes in for the first time in the Bible. As I told you earlier, a name is the expression of a character. It's not something that you call a name and someone replies. It simply is a true expression of the character of the one who bears it. Now we are told that Pharaoh's daughter found Moses floating on the river, and she named him Moses because she drew him out of the water. Well, I will not deny that's one part of the name Moses, to draw out, to rescue, to fetch. But it has another name, another meaning. She was Egyptian, and the boy was raised in the courts of the Pharaoh. The word Moses is as a root, the Egyptian word for the verb to be born. That's what it means to be born. Something is now to be born, and it is buried in man, in the book of Genesis. It's completely contained in this part, in this coffin called man. But now, it must be awakened. It must be born, and we are told that he did not volunteer for the task. He was drafted. Now let me stop here and tell you, this is not a man as you are, as I am. This is a state of consciousness. All these characters are states of consciousness. And so Moses is playing the part now leading you, leading me, and leading everyone in the world out of the state known as Egypt, taking us out of Egypt into the promised land. Moses is true in this case, in him, in germinal form, is the entire future life of Israel. All the figures that you read concerning him are contained in us. He was a prophet, a priest, a lawgiver, a shadow of the king, or a foreshadowing of the king, a victor, an exile, a fugitive, and a man of God. All these are figures in the state called Moses. Now he's leading us out. Let us see what he has in common with the other characters named in tonight's subject, Elijah and Jesus. No one knows the burial place of Moses, as we're told in the very last book 
of the prophets called Deuteronomy. Moses died and he was buried. Who buried him? The Lord buried him. And to this day, no one in Israel knows the burial place of Moses. You'll find it in your Bible, the 34th chapter of Deuteronomy. No one knows. You're told that Elijah... Now the word Elijah means my God is Jehovah. While talking to his disciple, Elisha parted by this fiery chariot and fiery horses as he was lifted up into heaven by a whirlwind. Therefore, no one knows his burial place because he wasn't buried. He was transported. We are told of Jesus when they came early in the morning and they found the stone rolled away that his body had been removed. And you could say that no one knows where they laid the body. Where have they laid the body of my Lord? So here we find that at the end there was three, each having the same exit from this world and no place where they could find the body. Now here's a progression leading up toward God. Moses means to be born or Hebraically to draw out. Yes, something is being drawn out, that which must be born. Elijah, my God, is Jehovah, and Jesus, Jehovah, is Savior. In keeping with the statement in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, and if you read those three verses, the 3rd, the 7th, and the 11th, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. If you read it on the surface, it will mean nothing to you. But we go back to find what was the great revelation as Israel is being moved out in this exodus from Egypt. It took 40 years, and 40 is the numerical value of the 13th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, whose symbol is a womb. So something is going to be born. Something is coming out of the womb in a so-called 40 years. It doesn't mean 40 years as you and I measure time. But something is coming out of man, and everything that is coming out is God, moving through the second stage called Elijah, and flowering in its fullness in Christ Jesus. Moses is the first to have the name of God revealed to him. There are many names for God, but never before was it revealed as it was to him, that state, and you are in it now as I am in it. And the name revealed of God, the Creator, is I Am. The third chapter, read the 13th through the 15th verses of the third chapter of Exodus. When I go to the people of Israel and tell them that the God of their father sent me, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say? The voice answered, I am that I am. Say unto them, I am has sent you. It was never revealed before that that was the name of God. Now we are told in the ninth psalm, the tenth verse, Those who know thy name put their trust in thee. If you know the name, and you and I have heard the name, but if you really know it, you'll put your trust in the name. Well, I tell you, the name is I Am. It's not John. It's not Jesus. It's not God. It's not Lord. It's nothing outside of I Am. The word translated Lord, which is Jehovah, means I Am. When I say I Am the Lord thy God, I really say If one would understand it, I am the I am, your creator. For the word translated God is the word Elohim. The word used in the first chapter of Genesis, and God said, that is Elohim. It's a plural word. Let us make man in our image. When you read the words in the sentence, I am the Lord thy God, the word I am is the same word translated Lord. So I am the I am, the God who created you in his image, and beside me there is no other God, no creator, and no other savior. That is what was revealed in the state known as Moses. You take the word Moses, Mem, Shin, and He, and you turn it backwards, it spells the name name, Hashem. The common word in Hebrew for name is Shem. It's Hashem, the name. If I take the middle letter out, which is Shin, and put it first of the three little letters Shema, it spells heaven. So here, the name means so much. I call everything out. I am going to be born, and being born, bringing all things hidden within me to the surface to be born, 
I do it in his name, so I'm drawing it out. The word in Egyptian means to be born. I am drawing it out of myself. That's Moses, Moshe. I turn the name around. I do it in his name, Hashem. And where do I draw it from? Shammai, out of the heavens. And where is heaven? Heaven is within you, Luke 17, 21. For my own being, I am drawing everything, but I draw it in his name. There is no other name under the sun by which this thing is done, and so how do I draw anything? I draw it only in his name. We are told he draws it all out, but he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, the promised land called Canaan. The one that will take the Israelites in his name is Joshua. Well, the word Joshua is the same word as Jesus, the identical word spelled the same way. He cannot go in. He's only the power that draws out, but he cannot take us into the promised land. Jesus does, whose name is Joshua. Before we reach that state called Joshua, which is Jesus, we pass through the state of Elijah. The word Elijah means my God is Jehovah. But if I say my God is Jehovah, I think in terms of some external force. If I say my God is I am, then you might think me arrogant, think me blasphemous. And yet that is exactly what the word means. His story is told us in the book of Kings. In the book of Kings, there is nothing but sheer, unadulterated power. When a man feels it and knows what it can do, untempered by love, he does everything. That's what Elijah did. He called down the fire and destroyed the sacrificial bowl, turning it to ash. He destroyed the children who criticized him and then the 450 prophets of Baal who could not bring down any fire. Then he did, in a twinkle of an eye, he ordered the destruction of all the prophets of Baal. Violence in the extreme. Then we move from this state to the Joshua, which is Jesus. They're the same power, infinite power, tempered with love. Now let me give you my personal experience concerning these states. There are states for when you meet these states, they are personified as men. Thirty odd years ago, I was taken in spirit into a divine council, a divine society, and the first one to meet me was the embodiment of infinite might. He was seated, and the symbolism is perfect, in a chariot, and hitched to that chariot was this perfectly marvelous pair of horses, beautifully harnessed and hitched to the chariot. Seated in it was infinite might, eyes of steel. Not an nth part of love came from that face to mine as he thought I heard what he thought. Whatever he thought, I heard it. He looked at me eye to eye, but no emotion or feeling concerning love or mercy or tenderness came from his eye to mine. Just sheer might sheer power no power on earth can compare to the embodiment of that power and just as we are told he then ascended in his fiery chariot leaving not a trace behind it seems such a stupid statement to make that not a thing on earth would lead one to believe that it could be literally true and yet my mystical experience confirms the truth of that statement for there is the perfect embodiment of the chariot and the horses beautifully harnessed and the charioteer is Elijah himself infinite power the horse has always been the symbol of the mind in this case the mind is harnessed it's disciplined and directed by the charioteer the one who is in control of that disciplined mind but without feelings no emotion of love then I was taken into the presence of infinite love infinite mercy and here I stood in the presence of Christ Jesus, a state, yes, a living state, and talked and communed with him. He asked me, what is the greatest thing in the world? And I answered in the words of Paul, faith, hope, and love. These three abide, but the greatest of these is love. And that moment, he embraced me. I became one with infinite love. I have never known such joy in my life, such peace, such mercy and such anything concerning these attributes. While in this embrace came this voice from out of space, and I found myself once more in the presence of infinite might, 
He's called Elijah. Another word for him in the Bible is El Shaddai, God Almighty. But no mercy there as yet, and no love there as yet, but sheer power. And it was he who sent me back to where I am today with the command, time to act. All of this was done in the state of Moses. It is Moses that state that I entered, not voluntarily. I was drafted as I was drafted into God's army without my permission, without my consent for a purpose to lead me out of Egypt into the promised land. But I had to pass through these states and everyone passes through these states. And so Moses is the mediator the state that is the mediator of all the things that happened to him so that he in turn may share with those for whom it happened. And so it happened to me in that state, the state of Moses, and then I in turn must, I'm compelled to share with you the things that happened to me, for they happened because of you, to tell you it's all true. And you say, a little handful like this and three billion of us in the world. It doesn't matter if only one came If one came and one heard of God's word and the truth of that word, it would be infinitely greater than three billion who didn't hear of it, for we enter the kingdom of God one by one. We do not enter in pairs. I can't take with me into that state the dearest soul to me in this world. We have to go alone, single. We're known singly and loved singly, and no two can go together. So it doesn't matter if I speak to hundreds or to one, or speak across the nation on radio to millions. It makes no difference. Do they believe it? So the story is, tell the story as you experienced it, in the hope, yes, that they will believe it. But no one has any assurance that they will believe it, but only as it is believed and accepted by the individual does he start the journey out of Egypt. Now, Egypt is not the Near East, your Egypt. Joseph, which is your own wonderful human imagination, is buried in Egypt. This is Egypt. He contains within himself the whole vast world. And now it has to be led out. It's led out by the true revelation of the true name of God. It was never revealed before. In the 50 chapters of Genesis, the word is not revealed, not used. And now comes the revelation of the third chapter and the sixth chapter of the book of Exodus. Go and tell them, I am sent you. All through the entire book, when you read this strange translation, I am the Lord, it is simply I am the I am. Why take the second I am and then call it Lord? The average person reading it can't quite understand it, but the identical word that begins the sentence, I am, which is yod he vau he, is the word that comes when two words are removed. The Lord, so I am the I am your God, and besides I am, there is no God, I am your maker. Therefore, you are really self-begotten in the true sense of the word. So these three are three fantastic states through which man moves, and the day will come that you too will be taken by a whirlwind into heaven and you will be brought into the presence of a state. But to you, it's something completely independent of your perception of it. When you look at him, he's a power. I mean a power beyond the wildest dream of man. And it's a man. I could paint a picture for you. Could I draw? If I could only paint, I would paint him. I can see him so clearly, and it's 30 odd years ago, more vivid than anything that happened to me today. It's so indelibly impressed upon my mind, and yet it's the state called Elijah. And one passes through that state where it is nothing but sheer might. You see it in the world today. It could be economic power where there's no feeling whatsoever, but simply to get new power. It could be economic power, military power, social power, intellectual power, or any other kind of power without feeling or compassion, just sheer might. We see it described in the world. There isn't a morning paper or program on the radio or TV that doesn't describe this might, the sheer might. Whether I can get the better of that nation or nations without feeling doesn't matter. It's power. That's Elijah. 
read his story in the book of Kings. But it passed from that to God himself, and that is Christ Jesus. When you stand in his presence again, he is other than you. He communes with you. He asks you questions, and you answer the question, and he embraces you, and it all seems so much the two of you. And yet you are told in the 14th chapter of Zechariah, his name is one, God is one, and his name is one. Verse 9, they aren't two. He seems to be another. He embraces you, but at the moment of the embrace, you become one. The Lord, the I am, is one, and his name is one. And then you find yourself fused with God himself, and there aren't two of you, not you and God. You are the very being that you've been seeking. You are he. Then comes the Savior. To be called also means to be sent. You are called and then sent to reveal all that has happened to you in the hope that those who hear it will accept it. For we are told many rejected it and many accepted it. That's how it's all sealed up. Eventually, all will accept it. It's a form of preparation leading up toward the fulfillment of his purpose, which is to give himself to us. For it is God's purpose to give himself to you individually, as though there were no others in the world, just God and you. And because God is one, and his name is one, there can't be God and you, for you stand in his presence. And as you answer the question, which you will, you'll answer it without knowing and without thinking. You won't speculate. You'll answer it automatically. At that moment of answering that God is love, what is the greatest thing in the world? You'll say God. But you don't say that. You say love. Then you are embraced by love himself. And you aren't you and love. You are love. You are the embodiment of love. And you never felt such mercy, such compassion, and such love. And you are one with but there aren't two of you, you are God. While in the very embodied state of infinite love, you are sent, sent to do what you'll be doing right in this world because everyone must be led out of Egypt. Bring my people out of Egypt, even though I will harden the heart of Pharaoh and keep them back in Egypt. I will still tell you, bring them out of Egypt. And so harden, harden them against what you have to say because tonight in this audience we are Christians and Jews undoubtedly all of us there may be one who does not call himself a Christian or a Jew who would think but I'm not either I'm an agnostic or I'm an atheist or maybe I'm some other creed but I'd say on a whole that as I go across the country I speak to essentially a hundred percent Christians and Jews therefore the word Moses to the Jew is a sacred name the one that was the leader chosen by God to lead his people, his chosen people out of Egypt into the promised land and Elijah, the great prophet, then to the Christians, what's more sacred than the name of Christ Jesus. And I tell you, these are states, infinite states and eternal states through which the immortal soul passes and he awakens in the very end being confronted by God himself, the ancient of days. And then he goes back into the place. And then you will know on the Mount of Transfiguration that these were the three who appeared. There were Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Then they all shone until their faces were like the sun. That's true. We are told when Moses came down from the Mount, they all were afraid because he shone so. Then he covered himself with a veil. Then he could talk to the people while he was veiled. For the veil is the human body. This garment is the veil to talk to man. For if you would see him unveiled, you couldn't stand the light. So when he went into the presence of God, he took off the veil. He was carried in spirit into the presence of God, and he's one with him. You can't stand the light. He comes down because he can't put on the veil. There's a light that dazzles the eye of mortal man. But may I tell you that whether you believe it or not, the morning it first happened to me, I was alone in my own room in a hotel on 49th Street in New York City. At four in the morning, there was no moonlight and there was no reason for light in my room, so the light wasn't on. And here was this unearthly light that filled the room and it did not subside 
until the sun came out. The entire room was completely radiant with light. But no one could see it but myself. But it was light. The room was completely diffused with light. And it wasn't any moonlight as it was four in the morning. The light, the artificial light, was not on. So I tell you that the symbolism is true and it's all about you. Everything in the book is about you. As we are told in the 40th Psalm, in the volume of the book, some translate it, in the volume, it's all about me. It is. The whole book is about you. And these fantastic characters are the eternal spiritual states through which you move. So everything is planted in you and recorded in that first book, the book of Genesis. Then comes the beginning of Exodus where man is making his exit from the world of slavery, the world of Egypt. And it's not in the Near East. This, wherever I go, this is Egypt. I am pulling myself out. There are a series of signs that will accompany my exit from Egypt. One of the signs, as you're told, only occurs in connection with Israel's departure from Egypt. And that is the serpent, Numbers 21.9. Moses chose the serpent and showed them, but no one understood it. No one. Today, how many people understand that the symbolism is true? It's recorded for us in the third chapter of John, that it must take place in the same manner. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You will find yourself one day actually experiencing the state of being lifted up in serpentine form, lifted up into heaven. And so signs follow as told us in the book of Deuteronomy, and Jehovah delivered his people from Egypt by signs and wonders. Always signs and wonders. Everything was a sign. But how are we to interpret a sign? Wait for it. All these signs will happen. At the nativity, the angel gave a sign to the shepherds, and people have completely misunderstood the sign and thought it was the event. He told you the sign, which is a deliverance of an individual into heaven from the land of Egypt. Simeon comes into the temple, and he looks at the child. He tells them, this is a sign that is spoken against. Now, in this audience for the last three years, I would not say there were many, but I have heard personally and through the grapevine those who spoke against the sign. Some never return in the interval of three years. So this is a sign that will be spoken against. How true is the prophecy to those who would come home today socially, and they still come socially, we dine together. But they will not be seen here. When we are together socially, we never discuss signs. And so Simeon comes into the temple and sees the child and makes the prophecy. This is a sign that will be spoken against. And those who come, you come. You haven't spoken so far against it, but I know dozens who have spoken against it to the point of never having returned to this auditorium. How true is the prophecy? And so he gives us signs and wonders as he brings us out of Egypt. The story of Christ Jesus, every event of it, is only a sign. Not a thing takes place here on this level. Everything recorded about him from his birth to the very end, the ascension, is a sign. Everything is going to take place in you. The birth, all the miracles, the fantastic things, and yes, the transfiguration too. May I tell you, when it does take place, you will swear those who are present to secrecy and yet after the thing it is so fantastic that you need not even swear them to secrecy but you do it automatically because like peter james and john they were not asleep they were drowsy they look at you they can't believe the wonder of it all and you swear them to secrecy but you need not because when they return here to this level they don't remember or if they do they only vaguely remember Peter was filled with sleep, yet he kept awake. But he was drowsy, and so he couldn't quite see the glory that was given at the moment to the one whosoever name he was. He is called Jesus because in the end, when the whole thing vanishes, there was Jesus only. These states remain behind for all to pass through, and one who's Moses, and at the very end, he is Christ Jesus. Everyone becomes Christ Jesus. There's nothing in the end but Jesus, and Jesus means Jehovah saves. He is a savior, and he saves who? He saves you because you are he. You are self-begotten. In the end, you come right out, and you are one with the being who begot himself as you. So these are the states through which you, the immortal you, must pass to awaken as God, and there's none but God, only God. 
So Moses means to draw out, no denying that it does. My friend Abdullah could spend two hours on the platform taking three little letters and analyzing them for us. Mem Shin. He took one letter at a time and put them together in many combinations. And the word Moses, as it is spelled, is to draw out, to lead one out of the great land of Egypt. You turn it around. How does he do it? He does it by the name that was revealed to him, Hashem, which means name. Well, what was the name I am? Go and tell them I am sent you. Well, that's Hashem. Now, take the middle one out, Shin, put it first, and that's Shema, the heaven. And he draws it out of heaven. Where is heaven? Heaven is within you. So he draws the whole thing out of himself. So Moses is sent. He didn't want to return. He is drafted. So man is put into the state of Moses and becomes one with the state. Then he is leading himself out of the confusion of Egypt into the calmness, the peace, and the joy that is God. But he had to pass through the states of Elijah. And Elijah is sheer might, nothing but power. So he's called the personification of all the prophets. No mercy in it, just cold-blooded prophecy and destruction. But he has to move through that, and he moves up to Jesus. And so at the end, everyone is Jesus. And yet may I tell you that you will not lose your individuality. Everyone will be Christ-like without losing their wonderful, definite individuality. I will know you. You will know me. And yet you'll be transformed and I'll be transformed. I can't describe what I saw. I can't find the words to describe what I revealed to the one who is not here tonight and swore her to secrecy. But I'm quite sure she was in the state of semi-sleep and would not or could not remember, but it's more vivid than this room is now what happened. So I tell you, everyone is destined for it. You may take it lightly and think, well, that's silly, because that's the whole vast world. They've been teaching this story for 2,000 years or beyond that, but they don't see the mystery. It's all a mystery. As I told you earlier, a mystery is not a matter to be kept secret, but a truth that is mysterious in character. A secret. I've been asked in this auditorium, is it right to tell it? Certainly it's right to tell it. You can't restrain yourself, but it's something difficult to describe because it's mysterious in character. Not a thing to be hidden from the world, but you are destined to be Christ Jesus. But you will not become aware of your heavenly inheritance so long as you still wear the garment, which is a veil. For this is the veil, but you will continue to do your work and tell your story to all who listen. But you will not become fully aware of the inheritance while you are still clothed in a garment of flesh and blood. So Moses begins the great exodus. It really is the beginning of the birth of Israel. He not only attends the birth, but also in him Israel is born. So in the state called Moses, Israel is born. Everyone without their permission is put into the state of Moses, and then he is pulled out and pulled out to the flower that is Christ Jesus. But he passes through the mighty state Elijah, one who could bring down the very fires of heaven and destroy the world. There are moments that they do it. Watch the world and see it. They do it unmoved by mercy, unmoved by compassion whatsoever. But it's a state. One day you'll be taken in spirit into the presence and you're awed by the presence of this might, and it's man, and it's Elijah. He's actually seated in his chariot, and there are horses, the symbol of the mind, beautifully harnessed, meaning a disciplined mind, and hitched up to the chariot. He's the charioteer. Then you go past him, taken by the wind. He doesn't take you past, but you go past him into the presence of the Ancient of Days. Then comes the most glorious thing in the world, love here. Love stands in your presence and it's still a state. You answer the state and then you become one with the state. And that state is God. It is Christ Jesus. All states are granted, but you'll meet them and meet them in this holy assemblage. Each will be identified and they are all part of the stories of the scriptures. So I tell you, these are not characters. The name signifies the eternal state through which you and I pass. Everyone is destined to meet the same end, and the end is God. 
We all awaken as God, so let us make men in our image is true. That is the Elohim, but the name isn't really revealed until the journey starts. Now tonight, I hope you believe the name. If you believe the name, read the ninth chapter, the tenth verse of the book of Psalms. Those who know thy name will put their trust in thee. For, O Lord, thou would not forsake those who seek thee. It should not be, but, O Lord, for again you get off the beat. For God, the word now, O Lord, is yod He vau He I am, is addressing himself, having found the name, I put my trust in thee. I believe I am the man that I want to be. I put my trust in thee. Can I dare to assume that I am now the man that I want to be, even though everything in the world denies it? I dare to. I'm putting my trust in thee, and your name is I am. For I am would not forsake myself who seeks thee. That's what it means. Read it carefully in Psalms 9.10. So if I find the name, I must put my trust in him. Now we go to church, get on our knees, and pray to something other than I am. We make our appeal to everything but I am. So the journey has not started. No man starts out of Egypt toward the promised land made by God himself, the I am, to the fathers, as told us in Genesis, until he finds the name that leads him out. No other name can lead him out. He sends his leader, which is Moses, something to be born. That's what it means. That's what the word means, but it draws you out. Also means to draw out to rescue, but it is something to be born, heading toward the perfect, itself being not the perfect, but tending toward the perfect. So do you believe the name I told you this night that is the name of God? If you really do, you put your trust in him. If you go out of here tonight hoping that something other than this name will draw you out of sickness or poverty or being unknown or anything else in the world, you have not put your trust in him. If you really believe it, you'll put your trust in his name. Now it's entirely up to you. I can do no more than tell you the name and hope that you will trust in his name trusting in his name you're moving out of egypt into the land that was promised he himself who pulls you out does not enter the land he cannot go in but joshua will take you in my servant joshua who is jesus so you go into the land by becoming one with jesus that's the land for he himself is the kingdom he is the king and the kingdom for you rise into a land completely subject to your imaginative power and so Christ Jesus is both king and kingdom. And you rise into it. But he who pulls you out by revealing his name can't take you in. He brings you to the border. Then you are told, as he said to Moses, look to the north, the south, the east, and the west. As far as the eye can go, that is the land. But you can't go in. Joshua takes them in. All Israel will go in, but led only by Joshua. So you're led right up to Joshua to answer the question correctly. You become one with him and you're one with the king. You are the king and you are the kingdom. Deuteronomy 34.4, Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. So believe me, the story is true. The symbolism is true. Everything about it. But if you do not believe in the name, why then you may still be playing the part of Jacob. Before he can start, he's not leading Jacob out of Egypt. He's leading Israel. Jacob has to be transformed into Israel before the journey from Egypt can start. But Jacob is a smart, wonderful fellow, the psychological you, that can play all kinds of games by self-deception and get results. Persuade myself that things are as I would like them to be, and to that degree that I am self-persuaded, I'll become them. That's Jacob, but he cannot start the journey out of Egypt until his name is transformed into Israel. As he's transformed into Israel, Israel is led by the state known as Moses, one who is about to be born. All the things buried in him, and it's God buried in him, brings them all to the surface in full bloom. So I ask you tonight to, above all things, believe in the name above all things. 
If tonight you are unemployed, use the name, trust in his name. I am gainfully employed. If you're not in the chips, as it were, well then, I've never had more in my life. Never enjoyed such comfort, such freedom from the pressure, from the wants of this life. Use the name. And so I must repeat it again, the ninth chapter, the tenth verse of Psalms. Those who know thy name put their trust in thee. If you know the name, if you don't believe the name, you will not put your trust in that name. But tonight, millions of people are going to the churches across the Christian world, lighting candles and putting their trust in a candle or something on the wall or some little thing on the outside. I have seen them, all of the Christian churches. I'm not singling out one denomination. I've seen them. I've seen people on Fifth Avenue in New York City get right down on the street, on the sidewalk, and prostrate themselves before a man made edifice called a cathedral. Whether it was St. Thomas Cathedral or St. Patrick's Cathedral or some other cathedral and worship a man-made structure. And that's where they put their trust. But if you know his name, you'll put your trust in his name and his name is I am. Tell no one what you're doing. Just simply quietly appropriate the state in his name. But we are told you earlier that when we're told to ask in his name and call upon his name, it really means that phrase means to ask with and to call with his name, not call upon his name as millions do, saying in the name of Jesus Christ, so and so. No, his name is not Jesus Christ. His name is I am. So call with his name. Don't call upon any name. Call with his name and the name is I am. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence followed by a short question and answer session as we will do now. Let us go into the silence. Now, are there any questions, please? Question inaudible. Answer, my dear Armageddon, bring it in. This is it. This whole vast world is really Egypt, and we, individually, we are Egypt. And then you begin to believe in his name, when no doctor could help, no one could help. And then you go up in your imagination, that's Joseph. You dare to enact a scene implying the fulfillment of your dream. Then came to this moment excruciating pain that Israel owed several minutes 
Then came the breaking of all the wires that bound you and you were free. That was Armageddon, but the whole vast world is Armageddon. Question. Are the characters all myself? Are they all states and stages of my consciousness? Neville says, yes, my dear. For instance, seated as you are now, you could be in as many states as it would be molded in this section of time. But the state to which you most often return and occupy most of the time, that state constitutes your real self for the moment. When someone feels more depressed in the course of a day than they feel elated, well, depression is the state that is their home. Others would feel secure, would feel powerful. These are only states. But you see, every state needs a man as an agent to express it. So a man or woman has to express the state of Moses. Moses is a state. Elijah is a state. But it can't express itself. It needs an agent. And the agent is always man. So a man, the pilgrim, moves into a state and then the state becomes animated. If you saw it, it's personified as man only becomes you occupy it. And so these are states. All states need agents, and the agent is always a man. The state of love needs a man to express it. The state of hate needs a man to express it. It can't express itself. Man is the operant power. Where man is not nature is barren. The states are barren. They don't bear. But where man is the state begins to bear. But these are the important states through which we pass, and we go right up to that final state. There is no state beyond that in this drama, which is Christ Jesus. That's the final state. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, Hebrews 1, 2. That's the final state, question inaudible. Neville says, my dear, I am is the operant power. It's God himself. So you say, I am nothing. That's a state. I am ill. Illness is a state. The same I am is playing and clothing himself differently. I am wealthy. I am poor. Poverty, wealth, health, and sickness are states. But I am clothing himself in any state takes upon himself the consequences of that state. Why not become selective in choosing states? But all these parts we live are still moving him toward. But he finds the name I am. He then moves towards the final goal in spite of himself. In spite of himself, he moves toward that wonderful state where he is brought into the presence of the Ancient of Days. And the story told us in the seventh chapter of Daniel is true. Who did he see in the presence of the Ancient of Days? One that resembled the sons of man, right in the presence of the Ancient of Days, and then you'll answer correctly, and you're one with him. There aren't two of you in that day. His name is one. God is one, and his name's one. He said, what is the greatest commandment in the world? And he answered, and he's quoting now from Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, which means I am. Thy God, Elohim, is one, I am. The word is you, hear it. If you go to the synagogue and you hear that wonderful statement, every service in synagogue, Shema, Israel, hear Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, Akkad. It's a compound unity, one made up of many, but the word translated, we sound it Jehovah, Hear, O Israel, the Lord. That's Jehovah, our God, Elohim, is one Jehovah. But the word translated Jehovah is the first revelation to man. In the third chapter of Exodus is I am, Yod, He, Vau, He. So hear, O Israel, I am. Elohim, our creator, is one I am. I'm trying to bring out in the end when you see God's only begotten son and know him to be your son. And I know he is my son, are you and I not one being? I'm not sharing him. I'm his only begotten father. He's my only begotten son. Well, when you have the same conviction through experience, then are you and I not one? And his name is one. But here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. One I am. Question. My father's name, Moses, was given to him. Moses, would that have any significance in his life? He walked across the prairie. Neville says, My dear, I feel that every name has a significant value. If he gave to that great name Moses the value that it really contained, no wonder he did what he did, walked through the country across the prairie and braved it before there were any compasses in the world. If you want to give the same significance, because the word Moses is a powerful name. In fact, 
We have no names comparable to the names in the Bible. The name David, now my family, because of my experience with some other David, I think they have a bunch of Davids now. A little nephew was born two weeks ago, David, and so others. Another. It's my great nephew, so I believe that in the next 15 years we're going to have a bunch of Davids and Moses and all kinds of these names. They're the most glorious names. The word Mark, for instance, my little godson, I saw him in my vision. I called him Mark. So I told the mother when the child was born that I called him Mark in my vision. Well, Mark was the name. So there's another little Mark. And I can't find any name comparable to these biblical names. They have great significance. So I would say your father and your mother named him Moses. Marvelous. And good night. And this is a wonderful lecture talking about a very important subject. I am super fascinated by his discussion of Elijah in this lecture. When I first read the Bible all the way through, I did this by listening to it at two and a half times speed so I could kind of remember it all in a single sitting. Maybe it took like four or five days. One of the things that I could not stop thinking about was in 2 Kings 2, when Elijah kills 42 kids for making fun of his bald head. In the Bible, a group of young children mock Elijah for his bald head, and Elijah curses them, and God sends two angry bears to rip them to pieces. And this is a prophet of God. I'm reading, how could God allow this to happen? And so now we understand that Elijah is the state of power without love. And he is violent. I've always wondered that. Somebody else said that Elijah is the pre-incarnation of Jesus. That may be true, but what Neville is saying is that Jesus is the next state. First, you have Moses bringing you out of Egypt, which is where we're at now. Then you have the power, and then you have Jesus, which is God. So it's a really fascinating discussion. And when you look back on the stories of the Bible, you start to see there's a pattern and that the stories themselves mean something much more. And there are states that you're going through. This reminds me of the lecture that we had, one greater than John. And that story was the state of John in the Bible is the state before Jesus. And John is beheaded. That's the point where you lose your head before you can enter into the state of Jesus. But John is also in the state of, I'm not going to drink anything. I'm not going to eat anything. And he punished himself by trying to be pure and earn by grace his chance to be with God. So each of these states also tell us how to find our relationship in, in a state of Jesus. So I would love to get a better explanation of some of these other characters in the Bible, but these three in particular, it's a really interesting dichotomy between them and how they're related. And, and also I had never heard of Neville's story where he goes into the council, which we've heard dozens of times now. This is the first time we've heard that he also encountered the great might of Elijah with two horses and a charioteer, symbolizing power. And then Elijah was the one that sent him back. I find that super fascinating. It's also interesting because William Blake also visits Elijah in his poems. And then later on, Neville Goddard mentions that discussion that he has. So this particularly is interesting, even for people that aren't biblically interested. This is not necessarily a biblical discussion. It's a discussion of awakening. But in any case, I would love to hear what you have to say about it, as I love any discussion of Neville. I love you all so much, and I imagine the most amazing things happening to every single person that hears my voice. I love you so much, and welcome to the reality revolution.